1 Thessalonians. We'll have a couple weeks break after this, but it's been great to kind of stay with it and be consistently these last several weeks. And so we'll be finishing up chapter 4 today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so as a result of just doing my studies this week and thinking about the text that we'll be looking at, I thought a lot about funerals this week and just that whole process of walking with people through a time of loss. As a pastor, I've always taken it as a privilege to minister to people in that time of loss and and grief, this very unique time that really all of us suffer at one time or another. And and over time, I've noticed that there are a number of questions that come up in people's mind as they they try to find peace and to try to make sense out of the situation. Where is my loved one and things like that. They're just natural questions, even for Christians, that arise, uh, even if they believe that their loved one is secure in Christ. There might be some specific questions that come to mind and often do. For instance, what does it mean for my loved one to really be at rest? Are they right now conscious in the Lord's presence, or are they in some sort of sleepy state until the resurrection that we've just sang about? And if, if their spirit is with Christ, then what about the significance of my loved one's body? You know, what, what remaining significance do we supply? Is, is that really them, or is it just a shell of some sort? How do we think about these things? They very often come up. And what about the second coming of Christ? Again, how does that relate? Our, our, our uh, loved ones that are dead in Christ, will they be part of Christ's return, and, and will we be part of it? Is it kind of just like a big, you know, thing that we'll do together? How does all of that work out? These questions often come up, even if, even if later. We all know that Jesus promised to come back in this mighty display, and so we wonder about some of these things. I think the songs that we've sang this morning, really all of them so well, I think really harmonize with the the message this morning. Well, our text today really helps us answer these questions and, and others related to them. And you know, we shouldn't seek answers to these sort of questions, especially such important questions. We shouldn't seek them from popular culture. We shouldn't seek answers to these sort of questions just from sort of folk wisdom that's been passed down. We must go to the Word of God. We must go to the source. And as a means of encouragement, just something that, that's a kind of a reminder for us, we, we notice that we're not the only ones that have ever asked these questions. In fact, it's because the Thessalonians were asking these questions and were confused about some of these things that Paul's going to write what he does here. And so in God's providence, it helps us to understand them as well. In the first part of chapter 4, which we've kind of looked at in two pieces over the last two weeks, it's basically been Paul reminding them about important ethical and relational issues, things that they kind of already knew but needed to be reminded of and encouraged in. Uh, But here he's going to really share something basically new, at least in terms of its depth and its clarification. There is revelation coming to us today in that sense, certainly was coming to them. And so I've titled this message, I'll Fly Away, just like the old hymn, I'll Fly Away. And let's read the text together, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, and we'll read through the rest of the chapter. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. There's really a lot here in these few verses. I'm going to unpack the text kind of in three parts. And although I don't usually do this, I'm going to tell you kind of the three parts, three points up front. The first is we need to know this. And secondly, we need to see this. And then third, we need to share this. And so we'll begin with number one, this first point here. You need to know this. Paul begins by saying, we don't want you to be uninformed about this. He says that in verse 13. 
And he's basically saying, these are some really important things that I want you to understand that are really important, not merely at the level of theory, but even for how you live your Christian life, how you live your life as a whole. And it's not that they hadn't learned anything about Christ's return. Of course they had. I mean, some of this would have just been like day one discipleship stuff. Jesus Christ is coming back, okay? The dead in Christ, right? So, so some of this would have been just very, very straightforward. But there is also some details that we can really get into in some depth, and, and he's going to here. He's going to get into some depth in chapter 4 and chapter 5. There's quite a bit more. If you flip over to 2 Thessalonians, he's really doing a lot there too. And so we're going to wade into some of this today. And if you were with us on Wednesday nights when we were studying the book of Revelation, which we went through verse by verse all the way through, um, some of this stuff we've, we've covered before, and yet we're hearing it in this now contextual from a pastor, an apostle pastor, to this local church. And so I think will speak to us very well today. May the Lord be it so. They would have had a sense of the big picture of Christ's return, but there are some details that have been unclear to them and even some confusion that has developed that Paul wants to, wants to correct. One of the ways that we know they at least knew some of these things beyond the fact that these are basic things is that there's an obvious fascination among them with the end times. We'll see that when we get to chapter 5, and maybe you've read ahead, you've seen that. They are fascinated with the end times, and uh, some things never change, right? Uh, there's been a lot of fascination with the end times in the last 50 years, really over the last century, we could say, in, uh, in evangelical culture. A lot of fascination today. But at least, at least some of that enthusiasm has been more zeal without knowledge, Zeal is a great thing. Ambition is a wonderful thing, but zeal without knowledge is not such a great thing. Um, one of the Protestant reformers said, zeal without knowledge is like a lunatic with a sword. And so we just remember that, um, well, I mean, one thing we think about on the negative side is if we have zeal without knowledge, I mean, that's where cults come from, literally. And so it's important that we understand these things from the source, Paul wants the Thessalonians to understand these things from the word of God, from the source of truth, and we must do the same as God's people. We should get our answers for these things, not from a movie, movies are fine, not from a book, not from folk wisdom that's been handed down, but rather from the word of God itself. Confusion to have passed would participate in Christ's return? Or would they kind of already be in some heaven somewhere? How do, how do they factor into all of this? Well, Paul's going to state very clearly that they will. They will be a part of this heavenly entourage when Christ returns. He wants them to know these things, not because he wants them to be smart. It's not like, hey, I just want to download some information for you. Let's make you all smarter. It's not that, that's not his point at all. But it's because he, 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 it matters dearly what we believe. And this is why it matters what we believe. Because we live in accordance with what we believe. It's really that simple. If a person says that they believe something but live in a way very different, well, their actions actually give you a better idea about what they believe. Because we, it's, not, it's not a conscious decision, but if we, if we believe something, it affects how we live. And so what we believe about the end times and Christ's return and death and all of these sort of things, they have great bearing on how we live the Christian life. It's not merely for the, the sort of crazy uh, controversialist, the guy who's in his basement putting charts together, but really it is for the church. It is for all of us. And Paul wants us to know, wants them to be grounded, and ultimately we should be grounded in hope, the Christian hope in the return of Christ. Paul declares that it is because of Jesus that we have this hope. In the pagan culture that they lived in, in Thessalonica, remember this is not a Christian culture, this is not a Jewish city, they're not in Jerusalem, uh, hope, hope was something that people would not have associated with death, like at all. Hope was for living people. Death meant that you were beyond hope. They had no thought of hope after death. It was not part of their worldview. And so it's, it's, just, it's good for us to remember, especially when we live in a society that has all kinds of different worldviews, we can't assume that people would believe the same things that we would. It's good for us to remember how novel Christianity would have seemed in the ancient world. 
So in other words, Paul was not speaking in a context that was sort of primed to receive his teaching. So when he spoke, they didn't just go, oh yeah, that makes sense. We kind of already believe that. We'll take that in. No, no. What Paul was speaking when he spoke about the resurrection, when he spoke about sin, when he spoke about these things, these were very foreign ideas to the ancient world. There's an extent to which that's true today. We can't assume that our neighbors have the same worldview that we do. Very often, they don't. They have a whole diversity of worldviews. But for this little church in Thessalonica, whether it's 20 people or 100 people, we don't know how many people were in this little church. This church that Paul planted, just getting going, for them, they had embraced the Christian hope. And Paul wants to clarify some of the deeper things about this and about Christ's return. It's because Christ has been raised that we too have hope that we will be raised on that day. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and following has a really important section and I, I want you to follow me here because there's, there's, this is a little bit dense but it's so important and I'm not gonna go and, and read it but, but maybe you would read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and following. It describes Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. It's the idea that those first few little fruits that kind of come out early, the farmer can look at those fruits and then really see what the rest of the crop will look like when it comes in its fullness. And so Jesus, who died on the cross and ultimately was raised on the third day to life, he is the first fruits of the great resurrection that is to come. So his death and resurrection gives us a picture of what our future will look like. He died and was raised in a body that will live forever. So we too, our bodies will eventually die, but we too will one day be raised and given a glorified body just like his. We have hope for the resurrection because we've seen it accomplished in Jesus. We have an example. We have a model. One, and yet that is all we need. In verse 14, Paul is saying, just as Jesus was raised, he says, in the same way, the ESV says, even so, we too will be raised. So what will it look like to have a resurrected body? What will it look like to have a glorified body? Look at Jesus, and you can see. You know, there's something powerful about watching someone accomplish something that we thought was impossible or that we didn't quite have a framework for before. We didn't quite understand how it could be so. There's something powerful in that, whether it's accomplishing something in life, whether it's a career, whether it's a, an athletic competition, to see someone else do something that you thought, I don't know how they could have done that. Well, in Jesus, we have an example of what we look forward to. We have an example of what it will look like to one day be raised, raised from the dead. It's important for us to see that there are practical implications for this hope. Greg Beal, a commentator, makes the point that increasing in hope will also help us increase in holiness. Because again, it matters what we believe. Biblical hope helps us to live well in this world, if for no other reason because we realize that this world is not all there is. The values of this world are not ultimate. Biblical hope helps us to live well in this world. Secondly, Another practical implication of this hope is that Paul doesn't want them to grieve. Look at verse 13. He doesn't want them to grieve as those who have no hope. Losing loved ones is something that we all endure. If you have loved ones, eventually life comes to an end. And remember this, this small church in, in Thessalonica They represented the only Christians in this huge city. Again, this was not a small town. This is not Nazareth. This is a a large Greek city in what is now modern, what is ultimately Turkey and and Macedonia. And um, they would have been surrounded by people who, who grieved without hope, who had no hope. Again, totally different worldview. As N.T. Wright puts it, the, the worldview for these people, all of their neighbors, everyone else except for this little church, was that death was a dead end. There was no hope after death. That was it. Again, hope was something that you had while you were alive, and that really, once you were gone, that was it. But Christianity brought into the world a sense of hope that death is not the end. And this was new. Of course, it had come through Judaism, 
But this was something unique for the people of God. And the gospel tells us how we can receive this hope. Uh, the, the Christian message brings into the world, it did then and, it, and today, brings into the world a message of hope that death is not the end. In verse 14, it refers to the Christian dead as those who have fallen asleep. It's interesting the way it words that, right? I mean, it brings us to that question that I asked earlier. You know, what happens to Christians who, who die before Christ's return? In other words, that's everyone who's died up to this point in history and who dies before Christ returns. If Christ returns 50 years from now or 1,000 years from now, it is anyone and everyone who has died before his return. What happens to them? What, what are they doing now? Where, where are they? Okay, we think, we often say that they're in heaven. Okay, where is that? And what are they doing? Are they aware of what's going on on earth? Well, being asleep makes it sound like maybe they're not fully conscious. This has been called, uh, it's called soul sleep is what it's often called. And it's this idea that believers are in an unconscious state until until the resurrection. The believing dead are not aware of what's going on. They're spiritually asleep is the idea. And, and some have thought this. Some have taught this. Maybe you've wondered about your own loved ones. Are, are, they, are, are they with the Lord now? And, and they don't have bodies, obviously. And so what are they doing? Are they floating around on clouds playing harps? Well, it turns out that sleep was a, a common euphemism used to speak of death, and you can imagine why. Just from the perspective of the person who's alive, they look like they're asleep. And so it was, it was a euphemistic way to speak of death. And it was common for not only Jews, but, but also for Greeks and others would have used this language. So I think that's why Paul uses it. I don't think he's making a theological point to us in the way that it would be used with the idea of soul sleep. So we don't want to read too much into this idea here. If we had more time, there's a number of places that I could take us in the scriptures where we could look and sort of assess this question. But rather than do that, I'll just look at one. Just flip over to chapter five. It might even be there as you, open, as you have your Bible open up or as you scroll on your phone. If you look at chapter five, verse 10, so same book here, Paul says that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Live with him. Interesting. Believers who die in this period before Christ's return are alive in Christ even now. Alive in Christ. That is, they are conscious in the Lord's presence. They are not merely asleep in that sense, but they are alive in spirit only. Their bodies are asleep, aren't they? Their bodies remain here on earth. The dead in Christ are waiting for the redemption of their bodies when they too will receive a glorified body just like Jesus did. Jesus is not merely up in space somewhere in spirit. He has a body, a body that looks a whole lot like this body. He's not merely away in some spiritual form. Jesus was raised bodily and he ascended bodily and he will return bodily. It's important that we remember that it's a temporary arrangement for our spirit to, to be with the Lord, to be present, the, the, the spirit of, of our loved ones in Christ. But there's a comfort in that arrangement, isn't there? To know that they are conscious, they are with the Lord, they are at peace, they are in joy in the Lord's presence. So it's a temporary arrangement, but it's a good arrangement. They have it far better than we do in that sense. But there was some confusion in the Thessalonian church. Some wondered if they might have maybe missed Christ's coming. Could it be possible? How do, how do we know that we haven't missed it yet? And we really have thought it would be soon. You know, how would, how would we know for sure, they might say? What if we're left behind, as our popular culture termed it? We, we know that there were some in the early period that tried to convince Christians that Jesus might return spiritually, not bodily, that he returns spiritually, and so maybe it's already happened, and, but don't expect him to come back bodily, they would say. And the church recognized that as error, and Paul is going to call that error. Paul's going to make very clear that there is no one who is going to miss it when Christ comes. 
And on that note, let's go to point number two. So we saw you need to know this. Now number two, you need to see this. There will be a sight to see. When, uh, when we moved to California several years ago, there were a few things, I'd, I'd grown up there, there were a few things I really wanted my family to see, and um, just some, some things in the natural, the natural environment. Um, that, you know, it's, it's interesting, there's some things in California that the natural environment really has that are, that are problems, right? You know, in, in the Gulf Coast, you have hurricanes, and in the other parts of the country, you have tornadoes, you have flooding, and so on, and, and in California, they're, they're prone to droughts, and, and wildfires have been an increasing problem in the last decade or so. But there's some, some natural wonders there that are just astonishing. It's such an interesting, interesting comparison, thinking about that. But one of them is their, their trees. I don't know, trees might not sound all that exciting to you, but they have the largest trees in the world. They have redwood trees on the coast, on the Pacific coast, this little tiny sliver all the way up and down the coast, and they have the sequoia trees in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And these trees, the sequoia trees, are arguably the largest living organisms in the world. I mean, it is really a sight to see. I know some of you have been there. You've seen them. It's really remarkable. And so I wanted to take Joy and, and the kids to go, and we were going to go a trip to the coast to see the redwoods. And, and I'm sure Joy was thinking, like, what's the big deal? We have trees in Missouri where I'm from. What's the big deal going and seeing these trees? But when you see them, it really is a remarkable sight to see. I said, trust me, you need to see this. And it's a marvel to see. Well, in verse 15, Paul declares that this is coming as a word of the Lord. Now, this has been an ongoing theme in his letter, and it's really all over the place. We've seen it a number of times. But this language is also used in the Old Testament. You probably recognize it, don't you? The word of the Lord. Well, it's a calling attention to prophetic speech. Paul is going to speak prophetically here about the end. He's going to speak prophetically about the end of time, as we could term it, the return of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself spoke a lot about the end of days, didn't he? Maybe this week, maybe you'll read Matthew 24 and 25. There's a lot there, heavy chapters, but he speaks very openly about the end of days in Jesus' own words through, through Matthew. But if you go and you read those, in Matthew 24, verse 31, Jesus speaks of gathering in his elect. And that is what Jesus will do. He will gather in all those who are his, the living and the dead. All throughout history, in all places of the world, Jesus, when he returns, will gather in all who are his. What a sight this will be. Paul declares that the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now, I'll say it up front. These, we're going to start getting a little deeper in verses 16 and 17 here. These don't answer every question that we have. Some of them we can look at other texts, but some of this, you know, there's, there's not every question will be answered. But they, they do tell us a lot. And there's a few things that, that we'll see here. First is that it will be sudden. There won't be any way to plan for this. You won't be able to mark this down on the calendar that it's coming up. There will be no time for preparation. We see that very clearly in chapter five. We'll get to that in a few weeks, Lord willing. It will be sudden. Secondly, it will be triumphant. Our king will come with a great heavenly display of power unlike anything that this world has ever seen or will ever see. With a great sound echoing throughout the earth, the book of Revelation speaks of a great voice like that of a trumpet. Joel, 13, or Joel 3, 16 says, The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth will tremble. The shout comes from an archangel, one of the mighty beings of heaven. Jesus is bringing in his mightiest to announce his coming. Have you ever heard the expression, you know, that'll wake the dead? Talking about maybe your neighbor's music or something, you know, something so loud. Man, the sound of that hammer, that, that'll wake the dead. Well, that's exactly what this will be. This sound, this noise coming with his return will, in a sense, be calling up the dead from their graves. 
And this, this grand display will make these mighty redwoods and sequoias that I was t- just telling you about, it will make them seem about as mundane and insignificant as a little scrub oak. This will be grand. This will be marvelous and astonishing in a way that I, I can't fully put into words. You'll have to see it. You must see this. The compelling point here is that this will be an unmistakable event. No one's going to miss it. You don't have to worry about that. Christ's presence will somehow be manifested throughout all the earth. All eyes will see when he returns. Paul speaks again about those who have already died in Christ. And some of the Thessalonians seem to wonder about whether the dead in Christ would, again, have a part in this glorious return. And if so, what what would it be? Well, Paul makes clear that they will be at no disadvantage when this day comes, those who have already passed. And in fact, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. They're given priority. Before those who are living at that time, the dead in Christ will be raised and they will, it says, meet Christ in the air. This is their resurrection. This is where they will receive their glorified bodies that they will have forever. This is the moment. And it's interesting, perhaps they're given the priority over the living at that time, because you almost think, what about those who are alive? I mean, that's got to be cool. You think maybe they would go up first. They get the privilege, right? They get to see it in their own lifetime. The priority is given to the dead. I think part of the reason might be, or perhaps the, the reason might be, that they have been so eagerly waiting for this day. Did you know that those who are alive in Christ right now in spirit, those who have passed on, they are eagerly waiting for this day. Yes, they're at peace. Yes, they no longer have the sufferings of this life. And yet they know that that day is coming and they are waiting eagerly for that day. My grandmother who passed away two years ago is eagerly waiting for this day. Your loved ones who are in Christ are eagerly waiting for this day. They will be part of this great cosmic entourage with God in the heavens when Christ returns in power. And so will those who are alive when Christ returns. You might not have thought of it driving into church today, but Christ might return today. In that case, we would be alive when he returns. Christ might return later this year. At any moment, Christ might return. And so those who are alive at that moment, when he returns, they then come second in this moment. On that day, there will be those who are present and alive, and they too will be taken up with Christ and renewed and given transformed bodies. They're in second place, but they still get the same experience. Their bodies will be transformed to live forever. Incorruptible is the biblical language that's used. In other words, there's no sickness, there's no death. Your knees won't blow out. You won't get headaches. They are bodies that are created to live forever. Bodies like before sin entered the world. Free of sin. No sickness. No anxiety. No fear. No sadness. These bodies will be beyond that. And yet they will be bodies. That's so important. They will be bodies, not merely a spiritual existence, but bodies. So important for us to see. Do our bodies matter? Yes, they do. Now this body is going to wear out, but at some point it'll be renewed. I'll have a new body. What a scene in verse 17. We need to read it together. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. This will be our great reunion with our loved ones. This will be that moment for all those who have passed on. And again, it's not merely a spiritual reunion, like where we kind of recognize one another as sort of floating spirits. No, it'll be bodily to hug them, to touch them. There's no COVID anymore, so we don't have to worry about that. 
It'll be an embodied reunion. God will gather together his people, the living and the dead, from every corner of the earth. Of course, at this moment, we're only speaking of Christians here, those who are in Christ. This is that great gathering of the elect that Jesus spoke about. He will surely do it. This is where we have our hope. So you need to know this. And secondly, you need to see this. It will be a sight to see. Now, number three, and lastly, and briefly, you need to share this. I'm going to read 17 again. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What a word of encouragement. We will always be with the Lord. That is our prize. That is our inheritance. Forever we will be with the Lord, with peace, with tranquility, with joy, with the deepest of satisfaction. Think about the deepest satisfaction you've ever felt in this life, and it'll be like that, amplified forever. Forever joy. All these things that have made life painful, all the things that we suffer, they will be no more. Together as God's people, we will be with the Lord forever. To be in the Lord's presence is to be delivered of those things. To ultimately do what we were made to do, to know him. Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's our exhortation today. Lots of this is sort of take this in, know this, but, but also encourage one another with these words. This is, I mean, this is Paul's pastoral heart here. Do you sense that? I mean, he, he wants them to, to know these things and to help one another as they go through their own grief, as we all inevitably do in life. He said back in verse 13 that he wants them to understand so that they won't have to grieve in the way that the world grieves. And I set the stage about how all of their neighbors, everyone else around them would have grieved without any hope. Now, now, to be clear, his message is not, hey, don't grieve, suck it up, and press on. Grief is for non-Christians. You're a Christian, don't grieve. That's not what he's saying at all. Pretend that it doesn't hurt. No, no, it hurts, and God knows it hurts when we lose someone. This is not a call to stoic indifference. It's a call to hopeful consolation. It's a call to comfort, to comfort and console one another with the truth of God's word. Not cliches, not merely things, uh, you know, that, yeah, it always feels good to say, hey, it'll get better, and yeah, and it does, and and there are times I need to hear that, but at the end of the day, we ought to encourage one another with those words that one day, this will all be over. One day, peace will come. One day, reunion will come. One day, our king will return. That's what we need. Grief is a part of life in this broken world. And I'm going to talk a lot about that here in two weeks. I'm going to preach on Romans 8. Christians are not spared from grief and loss. You know that. I know that. You know, Jesus himself wept when he witnessed Lazarus' death. And the interesting thing is Jesus wept with Lazarus' death when he knew he was about to raise him. What's the deal? Come on, Jesus, get over it. Why, Why did Jesus weep? He wept because of the brokenness of sin and the pain that sin causes and all the havoc that has been wrought in this world because of sin. That grieves our Lord. And he wept. By the way, the resurrection of Lazarus is very different than the resurrection of Jesus. You must understand that. Lazarus eventually died. His body is somewhere in the ground in Palestine. Jesus' body that he was given when he was raised is not like that. He is not in the ground. He is in the skies. And one day, he will return. Of course, we we grieve when we lose someone. But Christians can cry with tears of hope. As one commentator says, tears of hope. I like that. For, For all of those who have died in Christ, They are already at peace in the Lord's presence, but that day of reunion is coming, and and we can comfort one another with these words. 
for all of us who have lost loved ones. Let, let this be a word of comfort. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you just are, are, are grieving. You're thinking maybe this is stirring up some things. And yet deep down, know that there is comfort in these words. And this is the message that we bring to the world. We must share this. This is the greatest news. Why would we keep this to ourselves? Because our neighbors don't believe the same things that we did? Their neighbors didn't either. Well, because my neighbors might think it's crazy if I say that I think that Jesus is going to come back in the sky on a horse. They didn't believe these things either. You, know, you realize that Christianity took over the Roman Empire to the point that the emperor became a Christian? Don't think that the Christian message is, it does not have power just because your neighbors believe differently than you do. This message has power in and of itself if we will only share it. There is hope. This is a message of hope, hope beyond the weight of this world as it currently is. And I'll tell you, it is often in those times of grief, in those times of moments, that we are most open, we are most searching for a word of hope. Let's be a witness with that. As one commentator says, this is a reminder though, I've been talking about Christians up to this point, Christians who have died with Christ, Christians who have, who have passed on, Christians who will be raised but we have to remember that if the resurrection is the bedrock of the Christian expectation, it is also a terror to those who do not have the Christian hope. That's also a part of the story. I can't gloss over that. If, if the redeemed look forward to Christ's return with, with passion and expectation, it can't be so for unbelievers. We haven't covered it here, but there will also be a day of resurrection for the unbelievers. They come later with the great white throne judgment. They are, they are not raised for life, though. They are not raised with glorified bodies. They are raised precisely for one reason, judgment. So just because one passes on doesn't mean that they somehow are, are free from the end time judgment. No, that day is coming. And what you do in this life, how we live, what we do with our lives will determine which resurrection you experience, whether the resurrection to eternal life or a resurrection toward judgment. And it is only those who have been covered with the blood of Jesus that will be spared on that day of judgment. It's not about your affiliation. It's not about your background. It's not about you know, how, how good of a citizen have you been and how much money have you made. Those things, those things are irrelevant. Have you been covered by the blood of Jesus? That will make the difference on the day of judgment. And that is our only hope when we would stand before God. And you know, there's no gray area in the mind of God. Sometimes we struggle. Uh, is, your, is your friend a Christian? Oh, I, I don't know. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. There is no gray area in God's mind. We don't always know. But it is clear to him, he knows those who are his don't let any question be in your mind. If there is any question, make it right today. Be right with God today because He is coming. And we do not know when we might pass on even before He comes. Don't let there be a question in your mind. Believe in the gospel today, repent of your sins, and look to Jesus if you are not certain that you are trusting in Him now. As we have this time of response, don't let this moment pass by. It's easy to push it off. Don't let this moment pass by. If, if you're a believer, but you've been struggling recently, be restored in the Lord's grace today. Find comfort in him, if that's you. You say, I, I know I'm a Christian, but I've just been in a funk, and I just have been struggling, and I, maybe I've been in sin, and I just, you know, be restored today. Call out to him. Renew your walk with him. Renew your joy with him. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're a believer, but you've just been burdened. You say, I'm, I'm not sinning. I, I'm trying to be faithful, but I'm just weighed down today. I'm just, I'm just burdened. There's so much going on in my life, so many questions I don't have. Find relief in the Lord today. Find comfort in the Lord today, if that's you. And as I said a moment ago, if you need to find deliverance, and if you are not walking with God, if you need deliverance from the eternal day, uh, the, the, the coming day of judgment, call out to Jesus today. You can do it today. I urge you to do it. 
today. Come forward in a moment. Let me pray with you. Today is the day. And however you need to respond, let's do it right now. If you would.